the technology's actually totally changed our morning routine. We used to just wake up with our alarm clock, we'd go make breakfast, we'd take a shower, we'd get in our car and drive to work. Now the first thing we do is we reach over to the nightstand, we grab our phone, which has been next to the nightstand in case we wake up in the middle of the night and want to check our email. We quick check our email, we check our texts, we might go on our computer, we check Facebook. We have so many more things to do in the morning and it's because we are constantly connected. So the question is, how did we get here? In 1999, the world's population reached six billion. Research in Motion had just introduced the BlackBerry and there were only 250 million mobile users worldwide. Social media didn't yet exist. Online capable gaming consoles were still under development and a concept called Web 2.0 had only its rough outline sketched in. There was this big dialogue in the 90s about Generation X. So there was this whole group of young people that were growing up and there was this incredible sense of alienation. So juxtapose 90s, this discussion of alienation with modern contemporary discussion of hyperconnectivity. I mean, we're talking, what, 15 years separating these two dialogues and it's polar opposites, hyperalienation, hyperconnectivity. 2011. The population odometer hits 7 billion. In that 12-year span, the world has become host to 5.9 billion mobile devices. Facebook boasts over 800 million users. Sony ships the 150 millionth PS2, making it the best-selling gaming console ever. And the internet? It weighs in at over half a billion websites. But unlike 1999, this time, things feel different. Our brains are very sensitive to interference, whether it be distraction or interruptions. And that when you allow, well, when this information penetrates and is processed in your brain, it decreases your ability to accomplish at a high level what you are focusing on. Dr. Adam Ghazali is founder of the Neuroscience Imaging Center at the University of California, San Francisco. And he happens to be an expert in the science of distraction. When you make a decision to focus on something, what we now understand is that the front part of your brain, the prefrontal cortex, has projections to the visual part or the auditory part of its sound that allows you to increase the processing of that information more if it's relevant to you, if it's your focus, and less if it's irrelevant to you, if you're trying to ignore it. This process called top-down modulation is what allows us to read a book on a noisy subway or study for a test in a busy dorm room we found that there are connections between the front part of your brain and the visual part of the brain and another part of your brain known as the hippocampus that becomes essentially disconnected when you are looking at, at distracting information. So in simple language, our devices ringing, chirping, beeping and vibrating 24-7 are serving to degrade our day-to-day -day conscious thought processes, like static on a radio station. But could the effects of these digital distractions have an impact on how we respond to the world around us, and more important, each other? Face-to-face -face social communication is what our brains are evolved for. We are evolved to be able to interact in incredibly complex social networks, to solve incredibly difficult symbolic problems together. Professor Mary Helen Imordino Yang is an assistant professor of the University of Southern California's Brain and Creativity Institute. In a recently published paper, Professor Imordino Yang and colleagues presented astounding findings related to two interdependent networks functioning inside our brains. The looking out network responds to the physical world around us. When we see someone twist their ankle stepping off the sidewalk and we go, ah, that looks like it hurt. How do you know that hurt? You know it hurt because you see their ankle do something and you imagine that on your own ankle to a degree and then you feel back what that would be and you share with them empathically something of their own pain. Our brain also has a system that looks in. This network is focused not on external activity, but instead on internal thoughts. That network is 
it appears to be um, disrupted when you're interrupted from the, the outside world around you, when you need to attend to things around you. So you can be daydreaming and kind of chewing over, you know, some social situation and what it means to you or some memory as you're driving your car, but it's, you know, through just regular traffic and you're just kind of thinking about other stuff. As soon as an accident starts to happen or something starts to um, demand your attention, you immediately stop that daydreaming, you pay attention into the world, and it disrupts your ability to reflect on the meaning of things. So when we allow our minds to close out external distractions, we move from considering the moment and instead contemplate more abstract and complex matters. The evidence suggests that we need these kinds of uh, internally focused processes to be able to imagine a future we haven't experienced, to be able to move outside of, say, what our parents and our family's constraints are, to be able to imagine that I could be anything. I could do, I could be an astronaut if I want to. It doesn't matter if I come from here or there. Um, and I haven't seen that before. These kinds of future-oriented um, prospective mindsets that are hugely predictive of how well kids, especially underprivileged kids, will be able to do in their lives, seem to be heavily grounded in an ability to turn yourself inward and reflect on and chew on um, information and situations and moral implications of uh, experiences you haven't had. To support this concept, Professor Imordino Yang interviewed research volunteers after they had watched a video clip with social-emotional overtones. In one particular interview, the participant watches a true story of a mother who makes a significant sacrifice for the happiness of her son. I'm not very good at verbalizing my emotions, but um, I can almost feel the physical sensation, you know. It, it's like a balloon or something just under my sternum, just inflating, which wants to move up and out. And that selflessness of the mother and also the little boy, you know, having these wonderful cakes that he never gets to have. Now, watch what happens next. And she turns it down. It, it makes me think of my parents. They provide me During that so long pause, the research volunteers' thought reflections moved from evaluating the here and now and instead reflected on how what he had just seen had emotional and moral implications in his own life. It, it makes me think of my parents. So what happens when our devices make this kind of deep reflection almost impossible? And what does it feel like not to communicate digitally for 24 hours? Rania Johns agreed to this and our cameras documented. And finally, we wanted to see if that feeling of disconnect was something that many of us were experiencing. iPhones, internet, email, this all, these were all great things when they were invented, and they were only invented so that we could solve a problem. And ironically, this problem solving has now caused another problem, and that's put us away from each other. If you ever see friends hanging out, everyone's got their phone. You also have young people who are using, you know, teens who are using the internet as a way of finding sex partners and they are also disproportionately having unsafe sex. I mean, this is the social media and the internet have become tools for mitigating isolation and bringing people together, but they've also become new opportunities for risk taking. The worst case scenario is that we continue to drown in, which is sometimes what it feels like, in, in the the river of technological advance. Um, and it does not look like it's slowing down at all. And uh, to the point that we are um, totally encumbered by it and we lose a lot of, of, of that special connectivity that we find with each other. In making this documentary, we talk to experts and we talk to you. Across these conversations, we found a thread of recurring ideas and findings that we believe present a never-before-enunciated framework for considering the impact of technology on human interactions. Digital tools have been invented by us to be able to facilitate these kinds of interactions because we're so biologically driven to social interaction. But we need to understand how the tools are now acting back on us, how they're shaping us as much as we are shaping them.
When we consider the transformational communication technologies of the 21st century, most are relative newcomers. But at over 100 years old, the telephone is anything but new. But as the phone lost its cord and its form and functions morphed, it quickly assumed a very central place in our lives. So just how important are our cell phones to us? To find out, we went to Venice Beach, California, a cross-section of just about everything that makes we humans the unique creatures that we are. Check this out. Not back in the day. Let me tell you, this is how we used to lay. You had to talk to each other one-on-one. -on -one. That before cell phones even come. First, we asked, um, how do I communicate often with my friends? Text message. Texting. 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 Um, do text message, so I'd probably text more than anything. Then we asked about overuse of technology. My friends overuse texting and social media very much. My friend's on her phone 24-7 on Twitter, and it's really annoying. <laughs> People be on their iPhones all yeah, day. Yeah, you can't even talk to anybody anymore. Everybody's always texting and taking pictures and... It's just not fun anymore. I think it's harder for people to like stay focused on what they're doing, especially in school now. Like you can just text, go outside the door and just answer the phone or whatever. Let's get back to natural communication. This is Dr. Geek, that's your face. Woo! <laughs> To get a better idea of how pervasive the use of cell phones are in our society, we created a device we call BagCam. And we went shopping. We picked malls in demographically diverse areas of two target cities, and here's what we found. I was actually on BART, the, uh, the train here in, in San Francisco just a couple days ago, and counting the number of people that were wired in in some way, either, either listening to music or searching on their cell phones or an iPad, and it was like 70% of the people on the train. And just reflecting back on 20 years ago, everyone just would have been sitting there, maybe doing nothing, maybe talking to each other or thinking. So I think it's a really interesting question on how our brains, um, being as plastic as they are, are responding to this very dramatic change in our environment. Cell phones are an incredibly powerful tool, but they're also these tools that can be misused, and we need to not pretend that they can't be misused. And We need to acknowledge these cell phones can be misused, and we need to talk to adolescents about responsibly using them. These digital means of communication put an incredible amount of responsibility on the receiver to be able to uh, build from minimal input um, a, an entire rich understanding of the person on the other end of that transmission. All you get is not even a full uh, verbal transcription of the person's message, but a tiny snippet of a verbal transcription that's been translated down into these teeny acronyms that you're supposed to build back up into the full representation of another person's perspective, situation, and feelings about something. Now, has anybody ever broken up with you or you broken up with them via text message or Facebook? Nope, 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 but, but I find that it's easy to, to like, you know, say sh through text message say stuff like that through text messaging and all that. Like sometimes, you know, if you don't if you don't have the, the courage to say it like, you know, with your voice to voice it out, then it's easier to just say, you know, I'm pissed off at you and send. My girlfriend at the time went to France, cheated on me, told me via text, and then I told her, well then, I'm going to break up with you on this text message. Goodbye. 
the no. infamous stories of somebody, you know, telling their spouse they want a divorce over a text message, right? It's completely inappropriate. Why? Because, you know, asking for a divorce is not about the action of doing that. It's about a whole situation, a very rich, complex social situation that needs to be negotiated between two people. Where we used to have generations that were about 20 years long, now we're looking at generations that are maybe only 10 years long, and it's totally because of technology. Dr. Larry Rosen is a professor at California State University, Dominguez Hills, and an expert in the subject of technology and its effects on society. He is the author of several books discussing the subject, including Eye Disorder. Dr. Rosen invited us to one of his lectures, where he freely allows his students to use their technology. While the majority seemed attentive to his lecture, sure enough sprinkled throughout the group were others making Facebook status updates, viewing YouTube, and yes, texting. The technology is actually making us all look like we have signs and symptoms of psychiatric disorders. We all look like we suffer from OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. How do we know that? Because we're constantly checking our phones all the time. If our phone is missing, we go scurrying around everywhere to find it. We're obsessed. A similar observation was made in Immordito Yang's paper related to the biological origins of real disorders and those same biological systems which are believed to be disrupted by overuse of digital communication. Emotion tells us moment to moment what, how we're doing in this interaction and people are continuously adapting to each other. Not, perhaps not surprising to think if you didn't have that connection, you might be like an autistic child or, or a, a psychotic patient that's somehow not as grounded in the reality that we all kind of share. And remember the default mode Professor Imordito Yang talked about, which allows us to contemplate longer range complex issues? Cell phones, especially the smart kind, are the devices most likely to interrupt that process. There's a core group of maybe a third or more of kids who allow themselves to be interrupted in the middle of the night by a text, an email, or a phone call, and allow themselves to be woken up, check it, respond, go back to sleep. And we're finding that that's actually causing a lot of sleep deprivation among school students, which is becoming an increasing problem. Before the advent of digital media and electric toys for kids, um, Kids played with whatever was around them. They had toys, they had manipulatives, they had friends, and they, you know, made things happen out of whatever was there in the moment. Um, and you could kind of use these toys in various innovative ways because they were, uh, uh, you know, they're sort of basic things. Building blocks can be used for a zillion different things. Um, the question now is how do the toys that we give kids that are designed to do not a zillion different things but like X, Y, and Z things, um, how does that constrain the way that those kids learn to interact with the world? For sure, you can be amazingly creative with digital media. In fact, probably more creative and the possibility space is wider with digital media than it is with traditional media. But only if you have the skills and the access to be able to you know, um, to be able to get yourself into the design of that media, which children certainly don't. I think we've seen, for example, with, with infants, it used to be thought, well, we could give them enrichment activities by passive videos and things like that, or programming. Uh, and now it's really not recommended that we give any screen time to very young children. So many families are being distracted by their cell phones at dinner, at a restaurant, at the kitchen table, that we're even recommending that families use tech breaks. Okay, everybody check your cell phones before we sit down to dinner. Okay, turn them upside down, stick them on the table. Let's have a family discussion because we know that family dinners are good for kids. They help them develop their social skills. They help the parents interact with the kids more. But if everybody's checking their phone all through dinner and mom and dad are looking at their email and their kids looking at their texts and Facebook, then there's no communication. But what happens when our brains attempt this relatively new concept called multitasking. And especially with texting and stuff because it's like a conversation with pauses in between. So like I could text someone at work and then be working but then you know I feel my phone go off and it kind of interrupts your your whole uh, flow that you're in especially at work. The term multitasking 
um, as it's frequently used, has been questioned. Some people refer to multitasking as a myth in a lot of ways. And what that means is that when you look at what's happening in the brain when an individual is trying to do more than one task, and we've seen this in our own experiments, is that what you see is switching. In general, what we're finding is, is that kids task switch often. We've done research, we've gone into their homes and watched them study. About every three to five minutes, they task switch. And the task switching is almost always to something technological, a text message, an email, an IM, a Facebook post. Something technological gets in their way. If kids are habitually distracted from that kind of reflection by being pulled into the world by short snippets of social communication that are coming in co almost continually. Um, the question is, will this bias their brain development and their mental development away from this internally focused mechanism so that it's overly privileging this outwardly focused mechanism, so that they're overly predisposed to noticing what's in the world around them so that they can pay attention when their cell phone rings or their text message comes in, and will that overly predispose them to feel bad for the guy gets punched in the face or admire the basketball player who can who can make a cool shot but not then to move beyond that and think about and so what kind of person is that basketball player that that person was able to accomplish such skillfulness with their life what kind of dedication what kind of mental qualities did they have to have to be able to do that will they be sort of stunted in the sense that they'll be overly focused on the sort of immediate um, uh, context dependent uh, implications of a situation as compared with the longer term moral and emotional implications of a situation. And there is preliminary evidence, really uh, quite alarming preliminary evidence, that this may be the case. There's an interesting study that was done in Canada where 2,300 first year undergraduate psychology students across five years reported their just social texting and they took uh, questionnaires um, where they uh, described their moral inclinations, like how important it is, is it for you to really reflect upon the meaning of your life and do something useful with yourself? Or um, how important is it for you to marry somebody attractive so that your children are pretty? Um, you know, these kinds of very context-specific, low-level, what we would call really not relevant to morality, kind of representations being important, like how you look, as compared with um, reflecting on the meaning of things and being a, a, um, a moral human being, a person who lives with integrity. And what they found is that there is a weak but positive and significant relationship between the amount that kids report texting per day, uh, the number of times they text socially, and uh, their moral uh, responses. So the more kids were texting, the more they were likely to say things like having um, attractive children is really important, and the less they were likely to say, it's important for me to reflect upon my life, or it's important for me to help people who are in need, or it's important for me to be honest with my friends and truthful. Another area of concern is the fact that our cell phones allow us to send communications of a very personal nature with little thought and just a few taps of a glass screen. But we rarely give much thought to the fact that the individual on the other end can just as easily forward that message with an equally small number of taps to someone else we had never intended. Software security giant Symantec commissioned a study to find out if a lost smartphone would be returned to its owner without an attempt to access personal data. For the study, 50 smartphones were lost in high traffic areas in cities across the United States and Canada. The results? On 44 of the devices, the finders rifled through the apps and other information clearly marked as personal. Attempts to view personal photos occurred on 72% of the devices, and attempted access to social networking accounts occurred on more than 60% of the devices. So a fair question is, if my phone was lost, what might someone find? Uh, I don't know. I would worry about uh, pictures, yeah. Okay. Pictures. Let me ask you, would you be worried about losing maybe pictures that you took of yourself and privacy? Would you be scared of somebody seeing yeah. pictures and posting them on I the internet? I have some
secretive stuff in there I wouldn't want other people to see, so yeah, probably. What about um, pictures that maybe you've taken in the privacy of your home or things like that? Oh my god. Would you be scared of somebody finding those pictures if you were to use your cell phone? I don't take pictures like that. She's lying. Just, oh my god. The national no, campaign to prevent teen and unplanned pregnancy commissioned a survey that examined the intersection of technology and teen sexuality. It was the first survey of its kind, and the results were significant. 39% of all teens are texting or posting sexually suggestive messages. 48% have received such messages. Parents truly believe the media message that says, predators are roaming the internet ready to capture your child. Research shows it's not true, and the research shows that most times that kids are contacted by somebody with unwanted sexual advances, it's not a predator, it's a peer. Parents and educators are terrified about talking about sexting. They just, they want to pretend that it doesn't even exist. It's, they want to say, oh, yeah. and, I, and I think that that's, we're really doing ourselves a disservice by pretending that it doesn't exist. I mean, it's, it's very much a part of the landscape of adolescent sexuality now. Does that mean every young person is doing it? No, but a lot of them are. And it, we need to, just like, does every adolescent have sex before they get out of high school? No, but a lot of them are. 20% of teens have admitted to having texted or posted online nude or semi-nude pictures or videos of themselves. Of that percentage, 11% were young teen girls 13 to 16 years old. Just like smoking and, and taking drugs and drinking and engaging in, in unsafe sex and sex without contraception, these are all things that we're worried that teenagers do. I think now we have to add sexting to that list. Even more alarming, 44% of teens say it's common for suggestive texts to be shared with people other than the intended recipient. In the case of nude or semi-nude photos, 36% were commonly shared with unintended individuals. When young people take pictures of themselves, particularly taking pictures and videos of themselves, and they're sending it to one another, and then they break up with that person three months later, because God knows adolescent relationships don't last very long. What happens to those images? And then if those images get shared with the friends of that person who you broke up with, what damage is that going to do to your reputation as a young person? And I've certainly had conversations with people at LAUSD who work with adolescents on a daily basis in that school system who talk about young people being desperate to transfer school systems because that sexted image got passed around and now their reputation is ruined. Finally, 38% of teens say that sending sexually suggestive content makes dating or hooking up more likely. Is sexting, does it have anything to do with behavioral sex risk? And Basically, what we found in this study with LAUSD students was yes, that the young people who were sexting were disproportionately likely to be sexually active, and they were disproportionately likely to be having unprotected sex when they were having sex. Professor Eric Rice researches the concept of human social networks at the University of Southern California's School of Social Work. He has received a $2.1 million grant from the National Institute of Mental Health to conduct research in an area that has never before been explored. When your social network breaks down, people become depressed. Being isolated is a terrible thing. People can, sometimes when their social networks break down in the extreme, they can become suicidal. One of the things that I see that happens a lot when people's social networks break down is they become homeless. In Los Angeles, there are over 11,000 homeless youths clustered mainly in the Hollywood area. On a rainy evening, we drove through the region and not before long spotted a number of young people bracing themselves against the weather. Unlike homeless adults who disproportionately suffer from mental illness or drug addictions, most of these kids are running from abusive relationships at home or have dropped out of the foster care system and have nowhere else to go. When you're a homeless teen, you're on the streets. Your networks primarily are other homeless teens um, unfortunately, people like pimps and drug dealers, and then overworked social workers. So these are incredibly well-meaning people who are trying to help these young people, but who have really limited time and, and caseloads that are enormous. What's been really exciting about the role of social media in the last several years for these teens is that now you have a whole group of young people who are actively seeking out 
internet access and cell phone access as a way of bridging out of those really dysfunctional networks. In Rice's pilot study, he identified two types of social networks, a street-based network and a home-based network. This is what the social network of one of the kids in Rice's study looked like. The letter circled in red represented someone in their street-based network. The letter circled in blue represented someone in their home-based network. Face-to-face -face interactions are represented with a green line. But what about the red lines? Turns out for homeless youth, 60% of them have a cell phone. About 40% of them have a cell phone where they've got minutes and their plan is working. And that other 20% have a cell phone, the object, but it's not working for whatever reason. And they, they're in the search of getting minutes for it. And one of the things that I've been finding is that the young people that have these cell phones are therefore able to be looking for jobs, looking for housing, engaging their case managers, connecting to their parents who they still have good relationships with, connecting to friends who aren't on the streets that are sources of positive influence and support. This cell phone really becomes a tool that these young people are using to move themselves forward. So is the use of communication technology among homeless youths as common as the studies suggest? To find out, we headed to My Friend's Place, a youth outreach organization operating in the Hollywood region. Within five minutes of our arrival, we met Chitara, Malcolm, and Kristen. So first question is, do you own a cell phone? Yes, I own a cell phone. Okay, so what do you do with your cell phone? Um, well, with my cell phone, I have family I call, I call some of my friends that have cell phones. Mm, that's basically really it. I mean, like if I have job interviews or I go on job interviews, yeah, I use the web on there, of course, Facebook, Twitter. If I want to get a contact with somebody that I'm close to, gotta, gotta type them in on the internet, send them a message and sh Phone, that doesn't really work. Nobody really answers the phone anymore. You're a homeless adolescent, so there's two pieces to that phrase. You're homeless and you're an adolescent. And as an adolescent, part of adolescence today is having a phone. It's part of how adolescents understand their sense of self. What do you mean? What are you talking about? Are you talking to your friends or family? Oh, I'm talking to uh, my friend. Okay. Yeah. You, so you stay connected with your, with your friends through your cell? No, they're not my cell phone. They're her cell phone. Oh, it's her cell phone. I stay connected with my friends through so my friend's share? cell phone. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Well, you can't be my friend if you don't want to share your cell phone with me. Yeah. As the group broke up, back at Venice Beach, we wanted to pose one last question. If you had to choose between never having a cell phone again or never talking face to face with your friends, which would you choose? Well, I'm 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 kind of forced to use my cell phone because everybody else use it. Okay. Well, if it's up to me, I, I I do it face to face. No cell phone. No cell phone. Never having a cell phone again. I rather have my friend than a cell phone. Never having a cell phone, definitely, because my friends are more important to me. I'd probably say never see my friend face to face because I, I to be honest my cell phone and and my texting makes me money so, <laughs> I'll probably choose my cell phone you would rather do without the cell phone no i would give the cell phone up right away and that's because humans were not born with cell phones we've only used them to increase our communication we were not born with friends either we we're born alone but we're born around other people aren't we that we can make our friends people have always been around together there was never one guy at a time we all came out here together, don't you think? But cell phones are not the only technology that has transformed the social construct. Gaming has also. But before we explore the social worlds associated with gaming, let's first check in with Rania, who's now two hours into her day without technology. For today, I have planned that I'm going to meet up with my friend Adam, and we're going to go work out. Do you want to do push-ups as well, or sit-ups and stuff? On yeah, the sure. beach, maybe on this grass, or no? Like, not on the beach, like, there's like that, like this kind of grassy area, like on um, ocean. Okay, let's do that. Rania and Anna <laughs> got a major workout as they climbed the famous Santa Monica stairs. Afterwards, they headed west for a beachside workout. All along the way, they pleasantly chatted with no devices to interrupt their conversation. 
When I was doing gaming more, the game that I particularly liked playing was Final Fantasy. And I think that's because it's this magical world where you're allowed to just be someone else and, and do all these things that are not possible in real life. And there's a real nice adventurous story behind that. And we don't have as much adventure in our nowadays life, at least most people don't. So I think it just allows you to get away from the strains of your daily life and, you know, be in this different world. Hi, guys. It's me, Frankie. Sorry, I've been, I've been crying a little bit tonight. I'm just really upset. I don't oh, know what to do. I'm just really upset. My Warcraft account has been hacked. Meet Francis, or the name he's better known by, Boogie. He is an internet performer. Boogie recorded this particular episode in jest, but the content of the clip very accurately portrays how we usually imagine an individual obsessed with gaming to the exclusion of face-to-face -face social contact. Increasingly, though, that portrayal has become less accurate. <laughs> In the 1970s, when the video games industry booted up, the overall experience was quite a bit more primitive than anything in the real world. Even as graphics capabilities improved, for an immersive experience, we had to travel to a video arcade. That in itself necessitated social contact. As gaming moved from the arcade into the living room, the experience still required individuals interacting with each other. But with the launch of the Xbox Live service in 2002, the concept of online gaming, gameplay with someone thousands of miles away, became mainstream. One particular class of game uh, has been kind of troublesome, and that's the massively multiplayer online role-playing games, or the so-called MMORPGs. Now, these games are different than traditional video games because, you know, in the past you bought a video game, you played the video game, you beat the video game, and then you waited for the next one to come out. It had that cycle to it. These games are played online, usually with a team of people, and, and they're played continuously. Meet Serm. He's what you might call an avid gamer. In his man cave, he has two Xbox consoles paired to two 50-inch flat screens. Upstairs, he has a PS3 connected to its own monitor. And although he looks to be alone, he really isn't. Right. Basically, when you play a game that's usually a fighter game, if you play on the same console, you have to do a split screen, whether it's halfway or this way, horizontal or vertical. It's terrible. You can't see anything because the screen's so small. Even if you have a 60-inch TV and you cut it in half, Everything's smaller, it's terrible. So, Bullis went out and he bought his own Xbox 360 and we set it up next to each other, literally about eight feet away, two flat screen TVs and you have to be online to play. So both me and him in the same room, online headsets, playing the game with each other. With uh, Xbox Live and things like that, you are playing with teams wider and across the world. Uh, just like an MMORPG, and certainly there are MMORPGs on these console games. So these console machines now are more like computers than, they, than ever before. So the risk of addiction in, on those types of uh, machines is just as high. Dr. Kenneth Woog is one of a handful of clinical psychologists who specializes in video game addictions. But in Serm's case, online games is what's allowed him to stay connected. The really good thing is, you know, we used to live together, right? We, we grew up in Jersey together, we went to different colleges, moved out here together, and he moved to Ohio. So one of the things that um, has kept us together is playing online because, you know, everyone's busy, right? He's got school, he's got work, he takes care of like his family and things. You know, I'm working, I'm getting ready for to get married, things like that. But when you're online, you're really only doing one thing. So you're playing online, and you get to communicate with him. So um, that's one of the things that's really kind of kept us together. And I almost feel like we talk more now than when we live together and he's in Ohio. Because when you live together, it's, it's even harder to get on the same page. For which one? So now that he lives apart, it's like, hey, Wednesday night, we're gonna kill some people. 
However, it was Blizzard Entertainment's 2005 release, World of Warcraft, that truly altered the social concepts of online gaming. In immersive MMORPGs, a player's avatar has an occupation, talents, is part of a social circle within the game, and in some cases, can even form romantic attachments with other characters' avatars, creating a second life in the virtual space. In the virtual world, in a social sense, you have many of the same affordances for interaction with your peers or with your friends that you do in the real world. I don't see a lot of difference. I actually see it's easier for people to get together in the virtual world because you don't have to drive somewhere, that you don't have to fly to the other side of the country. The results of a groundbreaking three-year study by Nick Yi and Stanford University's Department of Communication found the demographics behind MMORPGs rather diverse and not at all fitting with the usual stereotypes. Rather than teen-centric, the study revealed that over 50% were adults working full-time, while only 22% identified themselves as full-time students. Women were also notably present in the study, with over half of the female players over the age of 30. With older people, I think it is a way for them to escape the everyday. So they're actually able to try things and dress up and, and meet new people and go visit places that they might not be able to do physically. So I know a lot of people who have disabilities who are in the virtual world and they live very rich, fulfilling lives. Lots of friends, lots of interesting places they can go, even if they can't even get out of bed. The Stanford study would seem to corroborate this idea, as consistent across the respondents was the clear message that engagement inside of these games can be so intoxicating that social interactions in real life can often seem boring in comparison. In the last 50 years, the roaming radius, the, the physical roaming radius kids are allowed has shrunk. So even probably when you were a kid, you got to go 10 miles on your bike and nobody cared. There is not a kid today that can go 10 miles on their bike without somebody wanting to know where they are all the time, uh, texting them on their phone, monitoring them in some way. But for kids from like five to 10, that used to be their free time, their thinking time, their socializing time, their unsupervised time. And now all of that happens in a virtual world. For some though, the endless possibilities presented in virtual worlds can prove to be a double-edged sword. Eu lembro que eu sempre fui fascinado com com jogos e jogava muito desde criança, sempre. Mas foi é, Perfect é, World que foi foi diferente, né? Ele era um era um MMO que é um um RPG online e os aspectos é, sociais desse jogo é o que tornavam ele viciante, né? A ponto de eu não, não aguentar esperar para chegar em casa depois do trabalho para jogar. E, e eu jogava, varava a noite, jogava muitas horas, é, noite adentro, ou é, é, faltava trabalho para jogar, ou jogava no trabalho, é, claro que de maneira que ninguém percebesse, né? Mas muitas vezes eu, eu arrisquei o meu emprego por causa disso. E chegou um ponto que eu, 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 eu tava jogando. 3000 horas é, por ano é, é, e, e mas não era não era tanto o, o fato do jogo ter sido criado para ser viciante tanto quanto os aspectos sociais do jogo que tornavam ele tão é, é, tão intoxicante né the social aspects of the game in the Stanford paper two out of every five male players and nearly three out of five female players felt that their MMORPG friends were comparable or better than their friends in real life. In fact, a notable percentage had told a personal issue or secret to their online friends that they had not disclosed to their friends in real life. Now, when basically they're spending hours and hours playing as a part of a guild or a team with other teammates, and they're, they're going on these quests and, and playing together. So, of course, it makes sense that these people are going to become friends and develop strong relationships. and, and uh, oftentimes these relationships become more powerful than the ones they have in their real life. Eu perdi contato com a maioria dos meus amigos, né, da, da vida real. É, até quando meu meu irmão veio me visitar, eu passava a maior parte do tempo jogando, é, ou conversando com ele sobre sobre jogar. Meus filhos viviam reclamando, né, da minha da minha falta de atenção. 
e a minha esposa muitas vezes é, ia levar eles para o parque ou para o shopping e eu não ia. Eu, eu ficava em casa jogando ou, enfim, perdendo tempo né, com, com jogos. E eu não estava lá é, para ver meu filho andar de bicicleta pela primeira vez. Isso ainda, isso ainda dói. The emotional investment in MMORPGs is substantial. In the same Stanford study, nearly one-third of players indicated that over the past seven days, they had derived satisfying and rewarding experiences in these virtual worlds that rivaled those in real life. Como eu mencionei antes, os aspectos sociais do jogo eram o que tornavam ele é, intoxicante. Tinha muito namorinho e muito flerte e muita coisa né, desse tipo no jogo e o mecanismo de casamento e de beijo virtual e tudo isso eram coisas que me, me, me mantinham né, super é, ligado no jogo. E eu conheci uma, uma jogadora, né? E a gente começou a jogar bastante junto e eu comecei a flertar com ela, né? E as coisas foram é, escalando. Yet while players reported satisfying and rewarding experiences in game, they also indicated that the most dissatisfying experiences had also occurred during gameplay. É, aí a gente chegou a se casar no jogo, né? É, e a gente sabia que ia ser uma coisa de mentira, ia ficar ali, não ia ser nada sério, mas é, eu me apeguei bastante e depois de um ano é, eu estava tendo um caso estava tendo um, um caso com ela e eu não eu não sabia se eu estava apaixonado por ela ou pelo jogo ou pelos dois when someone uh, for example husband has an interest in Japanese anime and his wife doesn't and he's spending a lot of time in discussion boards and communicating with other people that have that same shared interest then there's always the risk, of course, that, you know, perhaps a romantic relationship could, could strike up. And, uh, you know, basically where you spend your time is where your heart is. Foi necessário uma, uma série de, de eventos, né? Para começar a me tirar dessa, dessa situação. Eu fiz um retiro de uma semana para um lugar onde não, não tinha internet. Eu assisti a uma palestra motivacional, né? É, e a minha parceira perdeu o interesse, parou de, parou de, de jogar comigo e, e não tinha mais interesse na minha companhia. E aí eu comecei a buscar é, ajuda né? e, e recursos na internet. E foi aí que eu descobri é, o Olga, que é o é, Online é, Gamers é, Anonymous. Websites like Online Gamers Anonymous are support communities organized by gamers for gamers. You'll see the same clever screen names you might expect inside of an MMORPG, but instead of banding together for a raid, they're teaming up to help each other reconnect with the real world. Another website, WoW Detox, allows former players to anonymously post their thoughts and words of support related to disconnecting from World of Warcraft. The posts range from angry and uplifting to frustrating and heartbreaking. At the time of this film's creation, WoW Detox had logged over 50,000 comments related to the game. But at the same time, the game now boasts over 10 million subscribers worldwide and holds the world's record as the most popular MMORPG of all time. But while many enjoy the opportunity to engage in virtual warfare in the world of MMORPGs, Others are using these same tools to recover from the real thing. Jackie Mori leads the Coming Home Project team at the University of Southern California's Institute for Creative Technologies. The Coming Home Project is something that we started to explore the ideas of virtual worlds as a form of telehealth care. So we wanted to see if these returning veterans who had all kinds of issues from their deployments would be able to get into the virtual world, use it as sort of a, a gathering place, but also as a place to get stress relief. So we put a number of activities in the virtual world that were aimed at stress reduction. We put in a running path 
which is breath activated. So rather than make your avatar run by pushing the little button, you breathe into a regular microphone you'd use anyway in the virtual world and you breathe in an even regular pattern and you try and match a little biofeedback icon and if you can match that your avatar jogs around these islands and at the end you're more relaxed than when you began. And then we also have done something really amazing. We took mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is a proven technique to reduce stress, to alleviate certain illnesses. It's just an amazing uh, procedure that has about 20 years of research that shows its effectiveness. Working with experts in mindfulness, we adapted the eight-week program to be delivered through the virtual world. So with your embodied avatar, you do these yoga poses, you listen to the facilitator, and you are doing everything that you would do in the physical world, but without having to go to a session. We've noticed that with the in-world veterans group in the virtual world Second Life, that they use the virtual world as sort of a VFW hall for the 21st century. They, they talk to each other on group chat, and I love to kind of eavesdrop on that because you'll get all of this banter back and forth. I call it kind of the virtual towel snapping where they tease each other. But then if someone has a problem, they're right there for that person. If someone's having a bad day psychologically or having an issue that they need some legal help for, then they have the power of all of their friends in this veterans group that just comes right to their rescue. So whether it is to escape the realities common to life inside the modern workplace or the very real horrors faced on the battlefield, it seems that there will always be a place for online gaming and virtual societies. And for those who choose to be part of them, all the benefits along with the risks. In South Korea today, a very bright light is being shone on its darker side. A mother and father are accused of starving their new I met my husband online chat site. I'm very shy, so he first met I ever date. When I lose my job at the factory, not much else to do. He take me to PC Bank every evening. We stay till sun come up. We play Prius. Then one day I realized I late. I pregnant. Don't know what to do. Very overwhelmed. I do not know. Take care of a child. I don't know she come till my water broke. We name her Serang. It means love. But our life with Prius continue. We feed Sarang every evening, and then again when we come back in the morning, sometime during the day. But I did not know. When she cried, I hold her, I cuddle her, but I see she get thinner, smaller. One day, I go to check on her. She do not move. I look at her. Her little eye wide, but she, she don't lie. We tell the police that they do not understand. I don't know what else to do. (laughs) 
my husband in jail for two years. I do not go because I prayed it again. I just cry, cry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I'm not done to my baby. Although at its inception, the internet was designed as a collaborative tool, the World Wide Web in its first incarnation was essentially just a digitization of the concepts and business models that existed in the physical world. CompuServe combines the power of your computer with the convenience of your telephone to bring you hundreds of online services. It connects you with other computer owners. We could read the New York Times op-ed page in the physical space or online. We could buy a DVD from a brick-and-mortar Tower Records or at their location on the World Wide Web. Then came Web 2.0. It was a handful of simple concepts that emerged from the aftermath of 2001's dot-com bubble and now largely defines the way we interact online. At its essence, it put user collaboration, contribution, and participation front and center. There's a lot of people that were of an older generation that cannot embrace this technology called the internet that just got invented like a couple years ago that I was the first generation to really experience as a child. And because my brain was still developing at the time that it was invented, I understand it way better than anyone who's already old. We've just started looking at Generation C, and the C is for connected, collaborative, creative, communicative, and this is the generation of kids born past the year 2000. They were born into a world where Facebook existed, where iPods existed, where Wii games existed. All of the technology is something that literally was part of their birthplace. As the concept of Web 2.0 has matured, we're spending more and more of our time attending to its needs. And as a reward for all of this attention, the internet has made us celebrities, at least in our own little worlds but it is celebrity on the internet's terms. My friends overuse texting and social media very much. Uh, Facebook, probably. I'd say Twitter. Facebook. Facebook, for me. yeah. I, I'd definitely say Facebook. It, it kind of consumes people's life. You can tell everybody overuses Facebook because you can see anything and everything anybody's doing on Facebook as long as you're their friend. Instead of communication and being friends, it's, I think it's now becoming a business. There have been extraordinary events just in the last year. In the, last in the opening year. pages of his book, You Are Not a Gadget, Jaron Lanier, one of the foremost minds in the area of virtual reality, wrote, something started to go wrong at the turn of the 21st century. The World Wide Web was flooded by a torrent of petty designs, sometimes called Web 2.0. This ideology promotes radical freedom on the surface of the web. But that freedom, ironically, is more for machines than people. He goes on to add, this widespread practice of fragmentary impersonal communication has demeaned interpersonal interactions. I don't really see anybody like, oh, I met her through uh, Facebook and we're gonna hang out. It's more like we just talk over Facebook or we talk over text messages, nothing like personal or anything like that. Just the whole like propaganda of how people like, oh, it's all about having people like you and having, you know, like being known about so people care about you know whether or not they have a thousand friends on Facebook or whether or not, instead of you know things that actually matter like um, being like spending time with people that you actually know in person and stuff so if I you look online what you see is people going I I I me 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 my 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 using those kinds of terms that make us look narcissistic we're all getting a little voyeuristic and maybe suffering from some of the symptoms of voyeurism we're all certainly suffering from attention deficit disorder symptoms. We're all certainly suffering from other kinds of things like body dysmorphic disorder, where we see how good people look online and we don't feel that we look that good. There's some theory that, that there's something called Facebook depression, potentially, where we're watching how everybody on Facebook looks like they're having a great life and we're not. Kids who are, are overusing social technology to communicate things that are about emotion, that are about relationships, that are about meaning, that are about the future, uh, and not about right here and now, 
um, not buy milk now, but should we have children in 10 years? You know, these kinds of long-term questions that don't lend themselves well to these kinds of technological exchanges, if they sort of um, migrate themselves into these technological exchanges, they could very well um, be undermined for their emotional quality and turn into sort of action-oriented items as compared with meaning-oriented moral items. And um, that's an open question. Uh, but uh, neurobiologically, it seems very plausible that that's happening. In the United Kingdom, the Digital Futures Project questioned 1,000 teens between 8 and 18 years old and found that they had strong emotional connections to the internet. For those 12 and under, 50% said they would feel sad without the internet. The older teens scored even higher at 60%. Perhaps even more telling, 48% of the teens said they would feel lonely without the internet. The technology itself is not evil or good. It's how young people are using it. And it's how we want to be thinking about supporting teenagers in their use of this so that they're using these technologies in healthy ways and not unhealthy ways. Why is it that we feel so much of an emotional attachment to the internet that we'd often rather talk through it rather than face to face? One prominent fact is that for all intents and purposes, the internet does have a personality. Meet Jason Primrose. He is a social media expert. His job is to figure out ways to make your online experience with a brand feel more organic, conversational, human. More and more brands are jumping on the we don't have to talk about ourselves bandwagon uh, in order to be successful. And there's different platforms, you know, Facebook and YouTube build communities, Twitter drives conversations, Pinterest is very visually stimulating. And you look at the way, like for instance, on Pinterest, you know, you might have an inspiration board, and on there you put pictures of things that inspire your brand, inspire what you create uh, as far as your product is concerned, but you don't necessarily have pictures of your product on there. And then on Facebook, you go to a page like Target, and they're talking about, you know, how many calories you burn pushing a cart, but they're not talking about, like, you know, their actual things that they sell in the store. Brand voice is basically, you can, Look at a brand voice like in the commercials, um, you know, kind of an advertisement. Maybe the voice is sexy, maybe the voice is funny. But using Target again as an example, their commercials are funny. Well, so then their online shouldn't be boring. Yet, if the internet does have a personality, it is clearly a split personality. At one moment, a benevolent provider of all that is good, and in the next instance, a catalog of the worst moments of our lives saved forever. Last Friday night, I tweeted a photograph of myself that I intended to send as a direct message as part of a joke to a woman in Seattle. Once I realized I had posted it to Twitter, I panicked. I took it down and said that I had been hacked. I then continued with that story to stick to that story, which was a hugely regrettable mistake. The fall of New York State Representative Anthony Weiner is one that cannot be untangled from the communication technology of today both in its unforgiving nature and brutal speed. The timeline. An errant tweet of a suggestive photo is sent to a female college student May 27th. The next day, the photo makes it onto blogger Andrew Breitbart's website, bigjournalism.com. Wiener spends the next few days denying the incident. June 6th, additional racy photos are posted to the site. However, Breitbart indicates one of the photos is too explicit to release. On that same day, and only 11 days into the scandal, Wiener confesses to the incident but vows to stay in office. The next day, RadarOnline.com publishes explicit conversations from the Facebook account of Lisa Wees, a Las Vegas blackjack dealer. June 8th, while visiting a radio talk show, Breitbart is maneuvered into showing the host the explicit image he has copied to his iPhone. Unknown to him, the radio host snaps digital photos of the screen and tweet the uncensored photo to several news organizations. June 16th, 21 days into the scandal, Representative Weiner, who had been preparing to run for the mayor of New York City, resigns. I had hoped to be able to continue the work that the citizens of my district elected me to do, to fight for the middle class and those struggling to make it. Unfortunately, the distraction that I have created has made that impossible. So today I am announcing my resignation from Congress. Yeah! Yeah! Bye -bye, 
Or today, stuff can go online and hundreds if not thousands of people uh, see it instantly. It would be almost like if someone had a vendetta or angry at someone, that they would go up and print up a thousand flyers and send it throughout the entire community. That would seem absurd, but that's now what can happen with the internet. If you're 16 years old and you tweet something like that, okay, you know, but you're a politician and you're tweeting to people that you don't really know or a person that you don't really know, even if it's like a private message, you know, something crude. It's like, why would you do that when you're in the public sphere and you know the consequences if something like that gets out? I think that people feel less inhibited on the internet because of there's a perceived anonymity. Um, there's um, you're not having a direct direct face to face interaction. You can turn off the computer if you feel uncomfortable. You you can um, go to something else if it's not working for you. And it's not just high profile public figures that feel a strange invulnerability behind the glow of the computer screen. In the survey mentioned earlier. Over 70% of teens and young adults realize that sending sexually suggestive content can have serious negative consequences. Still, 39% of teens and 59% of young adults did it anyway. In fact, 28% of the young adults said that they're more forward and aggressive using sexually suggestive words and images than they are in real life. Masks. For centuries, they've been used across every culture for ritual, religious, or artistic reasons. But the basic purpose of the mask remains to, but for a moment, become someone we are not, and perhaps act in a way we normally wouldn't. In his book, Jaron Lanier refers to a concept on the internet he calls drive-by anonymity, or the ability to post a comment on a website using a screen name rather than a person's true identity. With no consequences at stake, communication often becomes coarse and derogatory. We like to think of ourselves as very, you know, rational, deliberate, strategic. We, th we think out answers and then we give them, but uh, increasingly it's clear we're really reacting moment to moment to what's going on uh, in the interactions. So if I say something and you look a little bit puzzled, you know, I pick up on that immediately and I uh, change what I'm saying, or if I I, I say something uh, and you look offended, I might, you know, oh, I just said something, you know, insensitive, and so I'll back off and, and say it in a different way. So much of our communication takes place behind screens. We are not looking at someone's face. We are not talking to them face to face. We don't see their expressions. We don't see their hurt expression if we said something nasty to them. We don't see them crying. We don't see them smiling. What we see is a screen that we're talking on. And I think that we used to have a much more fluid sense of, I have friends, I have colleagues, I have coworkers, I have family. And we didn't necessarily think about our social network as being a very concrete thing that we were measuring and that we were counting and that we were, that we had a visual of. You know, the, the fastest growing group on Facebook are older adults. And the reason that's happening is because the older generations are now realizing that if they want to connect with their world, with their children, with their grandchildren, maybe even their great-grandchildren, that they better learn how to text and Facebook. Because if they don't, they're not going to connect with them. So at its loftiest, social media has become the digital public square, helping to stoke revolutions and shape public opinion. It has helped us to stay in closer communication with our friends, and reconnect with old ones we'd lost touch with. But even at its best, social media has a way of bringing out the worst in some of us. My husband, Scott, and I had uh, been married about 10 years, and I had just given birth to our first baby, a little girl. And at the time, he, my husband didn't even have a Facebook account. You know, he, he just wasn't interested in the whole social networking thing. Um, so it was I who encouraged him to get an account so it would be easier for the two of us to, you know, share pictures and things like that. Once my husband started using Facebook, it seemed like he thought it was a great idea too, you know? So it was gonna be me and my husband sharing our lives with our new baby daughter 
with our friends and family, um, but it didn't so much go that way. I remember this day because it has been seared into my memory like no other day, not many other days uh, in my life. I was, uh, I was going through the credit card statements and um, I found a $500 charge for a hotel in downtown Chicago and my heart just sank. You know, you have your suspicions, but here is irrefutable evidence staring you dead in the face. And so I confronted my husband and he just made up some lame story about the charge. But I'm not stupid. Uh, previous to me finding the charge, uh, his behavior when he was in Facebook had just gotten strange. Um, like he was using the chatting function frequently and he never wanted me to see who it was he was chatting with. And by the time this whole thing unraveled, it came out that within two months of getting on Facebook, he had pretty easily found his uh, ex-girlfriend from high school, used the various features to uh, rekindle their relationship, and had started, um, you know, meeting with her to have sex. All in the span of two months with a brand new baby daughter. Infidelity. It's certainly nothing new and seems to be just another tragic part of the human experience. Again though, the ease and speed at which we can, via the internet, find like-minded individuals and explore ideas that in previous decades were only passing thoughts is astonishing. To test out this concept, we created the persona of a married professional man looking to engage in an extramarital affair with another couple, also preferably married. We cobbled together a fictitious composite photo using a photographic image we staged and another downloaded from the internet. The idea was to present our character as living in an upscale home and we indicated his location as being in a more affluent area of the target city. In the posting, we made it very clear that our composite character was married, emphasizing this twice in the text. We then posted the message and photo to a popular classified-style website available to users in most large cities worldwide. Then we waited. How long would it take to receive a response? 24 hours? Several days? A week? In fact, within 39 minutes, we received four responses. One from a local firefighter and three from couples identifying themselves also as professionals willing to have an extramarital affair with our composite character. One couple asked that they be considered above any other couples that may have responded to the post as they are willing to do anything. However, the internet is effective at placing a wedge between our most cherished relationships even without us leaving our homes. Barbara Weinken, a professor of French and Italian literature at the University of Munich, referred to the internet as a dark continent where more and more live rather than in the real world. And as the web increases its global reach, some of us are getting trapped there. People who have had no history of, um, at least no reported history of, of um, sexual compulsiveness uh, come in and struggle with pornography and how fast it has um, deteriorated you know, their life has deteriorated because of it. That's kind of surprising to me. A paper by Dr. Vincent Yoder sought to identify connections between social isolation and the use of online pornography. The finding showed a clear link. The more lonely a person feels, the more disconnected from society, the more likely it is that they will view online pornography. Loneliness, however, is not the only reason given for viewing pornographic images. Often, the first exposure happens in the process of doing homework. There are a couple other kinds of issues that parents are worried about. 
meeting strangers that you meet on the internet, having virtual friends. Um, the research is showing this is much less of a problem. And then um, the last one is pornography. And there's a lot of access on the internet to pornography. It's no longer the case that you just have to go out and buy a Playboy to see anything. You can now just put in a couple of keystrokes and you're there. And this is again another issue that parents should be working on with their kids to make sure that they're not assaulted by images that are not appropriate for their developmental level. And it is a conversation that apparently needs discussion. In a study surveying college students at two New England colleges, Dr. Chiara Sabina and colleagues found that 62% of girls and 93% of boys had been exposed to online pornography, a significant amount of an extreme nature before the age of 18. A small number of boys reported exposure to pornography between the ages of eight and nine years old. There's a, there's a strong stereotype of what a sex addict is, you know, the guy who's creeping around, um, going to seedy places. And the, the, the thing is, is that sex addiction really impacts people across the board and at all different um, ages as well. Um, so, and, and once again, with the internet um, appearing, they're seeing more teenagers struggling with compulsive internet use. They're being a, exposed to pornography earlier. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it really impacts people across the spectrum. These findings seem consistent with the facts as three of the world's 100 most visited websites are those offering access to free pornography. We've never had this, this kind of pornography in the history of humanity, which, um, you know, with all of the accessibility, with the intensity of it, um, the availability, uh, that it can be very specific. This is a new phenomenon. We don't know what's, what's going to be happening with this. Even more telling, statistics reveal that visitors to the sites are significantly overrepresented by males 18 to 24 years old. This age range, commonly identified with the net generation, who would have been entering puberty in the early 2000s, about the same time broadband internet began to take off along with much easier access to online pornography. Kids are being exposed to intense online pornography at a younger and younger age uh, through their sexual development. And we have to really ask, how is this affecting their sexuality? How is this going to impact uh, them in the future? How is it gonna impact their ability to have relationships or have meaningful sexual relationships? Dwayne Osterland is the co-founder of Novus Mindful Life Institute. It specializes in sex addiction therapy. Interestingly, one of the therapeutic techniques used there echoes not only one used in the virtual coming home project, but also the concept of engaging the default mode in our brains, to look in. When we're reacting to our emotions, we can tend to be more impulsive. Uh, we're not really thinking about, is this actually what I want to do? We're, we're just trying to, if it's anxiety, we're just trying to get out of the anxiety. We're just trying to move. Um, uh, we're just trying to react to that urge. If we, with mindfulness, you get to slow down and you learn, it's a skill that you can learn so you can pay attention uh, to your own feelings. And that gives you uh, time to respond to your, um, your thoughts and emotions instead of just react to them. And as you may have guessed, there's an app for that. A lot of the people we are working with who are struggling with this were using their phone, phones to access pornography. So we just thought, you know, why don't we try and create something that they can use towards their recovery? So that's when we created S Recovery for the iPhone. So we created an app that allows them to track their recovery process, uh, look at their emotions, being able to journal some of their thoughts and feelings down. What's really amazing and is really exciting is that, you know, I get people download the, the, the application and I get uh, emails from people just thanking, thanking us for making it. I think what's really great is, is that 
when we look at sex addiction and pornography addiction, that it's getting out there, that people are starting to learn about it so that there's help for people, there's hope for people, that people can turn their, their life around and, and find a life that they want, that, that's their life, that they feel good in. And that's, you know, one, you know seeing that done with our iPhone application, S Recovery, is, it's been great. It's been really exciting. In Greek mythology, the curiosity of Earth's first woman, Pandora, impelled her to open an exquisitely crafted container given to her as a gift. Only to realize it contained all the evils of the world. But as the evils escaped, one thing remained at the bottom of the container, hope. Meet Cameron Cohn. He's 14 years old and he designs iPhone apps. When I was in fifth grade, I think four years ago now, I, had a, I was diagnosed with a benign leg tumor and I was restricted. I couldn't go play sports with my friends and run around. I had a full leg cast and, wheel, uh, and brace for a while. I was in a wheelchair and crutches. And uh, due to being restricted and not being able to do anything, I decided that it would be interesting to learn how to design iPhone apps since I had an iPod Touch. iPhone apps were kind of this uh, big new invention. And being able to design them would just be awesome. Uh, so I looked on YouTube first because when I was searching for just how to make an iPhone app, it's kind of the first thing. YouTube is so accessible, it's so easy to use, and it's also so, rel I mean, it just comes up right when you search for it. I watched some uh, videos by Stanford professors and Apple uh, employees talking about how to design iPhone apps, and I read some books, and I just got really interested, and I kept learning more until um, I could make my own. iSketch, Cameron's first app was a hit and made over $20,000 in the App Store. But what Cameron did next reminds us of the moral and empathetic advantages of deep thinking and contemplation. After my surgery and my uh, biopsy, I saw so many kids around me who weren't as fortunate. When I was there, I had my computer and my iPod Touch to keep me occupied, to keep me thinking of other things so I didn't really have to pay attention to my surgery and not have to think about how severe it was. But there's so many other kids in the hospital that I was witnessing. Some didn't even have parents with them, and that's just so horrible when I realized that I wanted to be able to help these kids in the hospital, and they saw that I was getting money from my sketch. They kind of we all made that link together. That it's just such a perfect opportunity for me, and I can really make a difference through this. And um, they helped me decide what I wanted to do with the revenue, who, like where I wanted to donate to at the hospital. And I donated it to buy MacBooks and iPod Touches and iPod Nanos and gift cards to buy music, all kinds of things that really made the kids' stays a lot better. Normally, when you think about programming in the past, it's maybe adults, people who have studied for a long time going into um, like big workstations and trying to figure out how to work a computer. But now the fact that an 11-year-old sitting alone in his room can just search on the internet and start programming for this top new device and then be able to make $20,000 and make a difference, it's just only modern technology allows for that. And it's something revolutionary and it really is incredible that we can have these things that uh, this education is so accessible for everybody. The use of technology and education today is vital. It's, it's certainly an integral part of society and it's, it's used in powerful ways when used well. So you can share that with the whole class if you wanted to. Yeah. Our middle school students all have iPads. Um, and we use those both in terms of, of content delivery with digital textbooks, but what's even more important is they are becoming generative tools. Um, they're managing their, their daily schedules where they're now really in control of, of keeping themselves organized and planning how they're going to use their time. What um, homework is due tomorrow. I do not have good homework. Social media's impact in schools and with kids in general has been a game changer. My friend sent me a text message today that they're doing Twitter up homework updates now for schools. So just, like, that's an example of, of how far it's gone. I mean, take all that away and people aren't gonna know what to do. In the last 24 hours, I went working out with my friend Anna. Uh, we went cycling to the Santa Monica stairs and we did some workouts as well. And I went to the Santa Monica pool and did some lapses over there and then came home and baked a cake and I did a lot of reading as well. 
what I enjoyed most about not having technology is um, that I didn't have the pressure of having to answer immediately. And that's something that happens with Facebook or texts. People kind of expect you to always be on there and, and immediately reply. Can I get some of the photo? Can I get some eggs? Oh my gosh. No, this is Of all my communication technology, I missed most the part where I can plan ahead. So I can talk to friends and see what their plans are for the next day or week and see if we can meet up. And now I would actually have to visit their homes and, and you know, knock on their door. And, and actually that's what happened yesterday. I went to see if Anna was home. So I had to climb over the fence <laughs> and knock on her door to see if she was there and then she wasn't there. And it's like, well, bad luck then I guess, you know? And I already told you about this uh, friend that I have that went to um, Canada to a jungle and for three weeks without technology and just having to survive. And that's something that seems very interesting to me, just to get those skills because nobody has those skills anymore. And, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in 30 years. Maybe the Third World War will break out. What can I do with my phone then? You know, it's like, I think it's very important that you have both the communication skills through phones, but also the, you could say, survival skills and social skills to live without them. There you go. I'm connected again. The complex relationship we now find ourselves in with our communication technology can be solved in ways that are less complex. The U.S. Forest Service organized a campaign to encourage families to unplug. Getting closer to nature can get you closer to your family. If you go, go out in nature for 15 minutes, and I don't mean you have to walk into a forest, just go outside, look at some trees. That turns out to reset your brain, calms your brain down, allows you to not feel as obsessed about the technology. If you just talk to another human being for 15 minutes, the same effect. If you laugh for 15 minutes, the same effect. So what I'm recommending is, is that it's not an issue of giving up your technology to make you human again, it's an issue of balance. I mean, multitasking is fun. It's fun to jump between things. It has a high novelty load. I feel it appeals to us on a very basic fundamental level to switch like that. But sustained attention also has an uh, enjoyment factor. It's just a little harder to get there and you have to do it enough to start appreciating and feeling it. It's sort of like, I think, similar in some ways to what happens to runners, that they hate it for a while, and then they get over this hurdle, and then they find enjoyment in that just sustained act of doing one thing. Think of yourself as a brand. Make sure your brand voice is consistent throughout, and make sure that whatever you have going on on your page, on your Twitter, Foursquare, whatever, reflects what you want people to see, what you want people to think about you. And we've got to start figuring this stuff out fast. It's not good enough for us to say, oh, it's treacherous waters. That's, you know, this is, it's too bad. I'm glad I'm not a teen now because there's a whole generation that are teens right now and they're growing up in this world and it's our responsibility to raise them well. And it's our responsibility to make sure that they are not damaged by their youthful indiscretions. And we all had youthful indiscretions and we were just lucky enough not to have them digitized, but they're not. One of the things I always tell parents is as soon as you put an iPhone into your child's hand, as soon as you let them play with your iPad, as soon as you let them send their first email sitting up at the desktop computer, you should start talking to your kids about technology. It's really critical. We can choose when we use our devices. We have control over that. And I think it's an important thing to remind ourselves that we don't have to use all of these things at the same time just because we have them and they happen to be very cool. We can decide that maybe for the next two hours I will because I'm doing low level stuff that doesn't really need high quality or it doesn't have a time pressure. But when I'm doing something that really demands that level of quality, I shut everything down and I just focus on one thing. My guess is, is that just like everything else that we've seen in our world, it's kind of like a pendulum. And right now our pendulum is swung way this way. We are communicating heavily electronically. We are on Facebook. One out of every four minutes on the internet is on, spent on Facebook. We are texting. Teenage girls send 5,000 texts a month. So we are really all the way this way. I think what we're gonna start to see as the years pass 
is that we are going to start to electronically communicate less, fall back more to the center. We're still going to be communicating, but we're going to be a little bit more judicious about it. From a practical set of standpoint, it's important to turn the things off. I mean, the, the, you need to set aside time when they're not there to disrupt you, when you are not available to those technologies and you're with your family or with the people you love or you're with yourself and you're just relaxing and you give yourself time to think things over. I think the best case scenario is that we learn how to interact with our technology in a more optimal way, a way that does not detract from the things that make us most human, our ability to talk to each other and pay attention to one thing, um, and still take advantage of the amazing abilities that our computers and our whole um, uh, interconnected network has that our brains don't have. So, essentially, it's up to us. Analog communication face-to-face -face, with all its intensity, depth, and humanity is something that we should be unwilling to allow technology to entirely reshape simply for the sake of technology. In the final assessment, digital communication in all its forms should allow us to express ourselves in new, meaningful, and insightful ways, but should not solely define who we are as humans. The way forward will be navigated successfully, not by looking to the past, nor by looking to the future, but by looking within and realizing that no technology regardless of its reach or sophistication, will ever be able to truly express what magnificent beings we truly are.
Bitch. <laughs>